Governor Hogan, what in the world is going on with the Republican Party? Well, that's a really good question, Katie. Um, it, it, some of us are really trying hard to figure that out. I, it's, I, I never imagined it could get quite as bad as it's gotten at this point. I think we're really in the midst of, uh, in the, just the beginning of what is going to be a long you know, and difficult battle for the soul of the Republican Party. I mean, we're, we're heading off in a direction where um, you know, we, we're not gonna be able to successfully win uh, national elections anymore, where it's gonna be difficult for the Republicans to ever get the House or the Senate back or to win the White House back unless we can return to some sanity. Um, and there are a number of us who are uh, trying to return to a more traditional, you know, common sense conservative party, more, a more Reagan-esque, uh, bigger tent party that can appeal to with a positive message that we can, you know, try to work with Democrats on. But there's an awful lot of others who are gonna, can, wanting to take us down this path that has no chance of success. In fact, I was going to ask you, Governor, are you in the minority? Is the Republican Party now squarely the party of Donald Trump? Well, I think it has been, and I think perhaps it still is, but I think his influence uh, is, is slowly beginning to diminish. I think after the loss of the election, after the, uh, the crazy conspiracy theories about the election being stolen, and then particularly after the insurrection at the Capitol, while he still has uh, an awful lot of uh, you know, supporters in the Republican Party, it's dropped considerably. And there are you know, at least 30 or 40 percent of the Republican Party who do not want to see Donald Trump uh, in, involved in the part party in a substantial way. So it's, it's still a majority, but a, a shrinking majority. And it's a majority of a much smaller party. Uh, you know, it's uh, we've been shrinking the base and uh, we've got to grow the base instead. Let's talk about his scathing statement about Mitch McConnell. What was your reaction to that? Well, on the one hand, it wasn't surprising, Katie, because we've seen you know these kind of attacks uh, on fellow Republicans and on other people and kind of this angry rhetoric uh, for years. But um, you know, I, Mitch McConnell, who didn't vote for impeachment, I think uh, I think you know really spoke uh, how he felt, and uh, obviously he's concerned about winning the Senate back. And, um, you know, I'm sure there were politics involved, but I think he meant the words that he said. And, um, and, and, I, and I admired him for being willing to speak up. But for the president to attack him in the personal way that he did, it's, you know, it's kind of what we've come to expect. It seems that it, as if, Governor, people speak out against Donald Trump at their own risk. Um, you know, there's a lot of fear about Republicans, Liz Cheney among them, getting out primary. And I'm curious if you have gotten any backlash because you've been pretty outspoken about the fact that you would have voted to convict if you had been in the U.S. Senate. Well, not being in the Senate and not being in the House and not, not, not taking a vote may put me in a different uh, position. It also didn't come as any surprise for me to speak out because I've been speaking the exact same way uh, for the entire time since Donald Trump announced his, his presidential campaign. Uh, you know, four years ago. So I, I think some people uh, who haven't spoken out for four years are, are, are experiencing, you know, and finally did, are, are getting the, the, the brunt of, uh, of the criticism. You know, I also happen to be in a state where I ran 45 points ahead of Donald Trump. And so, uh, you know, he lost by 30 and I won by 15. Uh, so it, it, he doesn't have quite the same influence over me. And, and I'm also just not as concerned about you know, what people think about it. I'm just, uh, you know, I just, I've always been pretty blunt and say exactly what I think. Your father was a real profile in Courage back in 1974 when he was the only Republican to vote for all three articles of impeachment against Richard Nixon. But there are very few profiles in Courage today. Only seven Republican senators voted to convict Donald Trump in that impeachment hearing. Why do you think that's the case? Well, thank you for mentioning my dad. Uh, you know, I'm awful proud of him. I learned a lot about integrity and public service from him. He was the first Republican uh, in Congress to come out for Nixon's impeachment. He was on the House Judiciary Committee. He was the only Republican to vote for all three articles of impeachment. So talk about he was the one, the only one. Uh, and here we had seven senators and 10 members of the House. And, you know, I, I uh, you know, I admire them for voting their conscience and having the guts to stand up. 
I can tell you uh, without any question that there were far more senators and far more House members and plenty of my colleagues that are governors who felt exactly the same way, uh, but who haven't spoken up and, were, and, and didn't cast those votes because they were afraid of the retribution and the attacks and being primaried. And uh, the ones who did, did so at their own risk. I mean, you know, my dad back in the 70s, he suffered, he knew he was potentially ending his political career, but he did what he thought was right for the country. And I think some of those folks, I really admire the fact that they had the guts. There just weren't enough of them. Well, what about the fact that there weren't enough of them? Are these people just addicted to power over country, party over country, anything over country? Uh, I'm not sure I would characterize it quite like that, Katie. I, I mean, I, it's hard for me to put uh, myself in and judge how people were making these decisions um, and how they arrived at their conclusion. Some people really um, didn't, I think, sincerely didn't believe, thought he was wrong, thought he incited the violence, but that they that you couldn't or shouldn't impeach a former president and that the election was over. Some people, I think, thought that we needed to put Donald Trump behind us and not continue the the, the, the talk. And some people, I think, may have thought he was guilty and didn't have the guts to vote that way. Um, so it's a little bit of all that. But I don't I wouldn't say they you know, I, I don't want to characterize what they did because I, I can't put myself inside of their own minds and their hearts and figure out what they did, how they decided their vote. When it comes to this fight, Governor Hogan, over the heart and soul of the Republican Party, how do you reconcile the fact that 81 percent of Republicans say they have a positive view of President Trump and 53%, over half, would vote for him again in 2024. Well, it's a little surprising, um, but you know, he, uh, he, he really has uh, had quite a following over the past four years. And uh, you know, I think that's gonna continue to diminish as time goes on. And, and uh, you know, I think we're just getting by the election. It's surprising to me that so many people believe this this talk about the election being stolen, which doesn't have any basis in fact. I mean, you know, some of my Republican governor colleagues who were very strong supporters of the president, you know, they certified the elections and, you know, they wouldn't overturn the election. And, and they're telling us there just wasn't any truth to these rumors, but it's amazing how many people uh, believe them. And it's all about, you know, social media and, and disinformation. And we've got to figure out how many, how so many people were misled. Well, at this juncture, it does seem that more centrist, moderate Republicans, such as yourself, are in the minority still. Yes. So how do you change that statistic? How do you bring more people to your side, if you will, of what you believe the GOP should be? Well, it's not going to be easy, Katie, and I don't have a I don't have a magic wand to make everything magically go back to normal again. But I, in my opinion, this was kind of a hostile takeover of the Republican Party four years ago. Donald Trump is a lifelong Democrat and independent who just became a Republican, mostly supported Democrats his whole life. While I while I was chairing Youth for Reagan, uh, Trump was working for the Democrats in '80 and '84. So, uh, how how this came about is you know, we can go back and figure it out, but. I don't know uh, whether we are going to be successful or not, quite frankly. It, it, it's something we're going to decide over the next two years or four years. But as a lifelong you know, Republican who believes in my party and wants to return to a more traditional Republican party, I'm, I think it's worth fighting for. Some people have given up. I understand that. Um, and some people say it's, a, it's kind of hopeless. But um, I'm, I'm not going to give up. And I happen to believe we, we do have a chance. And uh, I think if, if we want to win purple states, if we want to win competitive districts in suburban congressional districts, if we want to elect Republican governors in places like Maryland, one of the bluest states in the country, and in New England with Charlie Baker in Massachusetts, and, and Phil Scott in Vermont, and Chris Sununu in New Hampshire, or Democratic states, you know, we, we, we can't keep alienating large swaths of the electorate, and we can't just keep trying to focus on a smaller and smaller base. You know, in, in Maryland, I've, I've, you know, won overwhelmingly with, with suburban women, with Democrats and independents and conservatives and Republicans. And we've got to find a message that can appeal to more people because successful politics is about, you know, uh, addition and multiplication, not subtraction and division. You can't win elections if you can't convince people that your ideas are the right ones. There's some talk, Governor, about potentially starting a new party, a third party. I've heard it called the Patriot Party and other things. Um, what do you think about that idea? Is that sort of a pie in the sky notion? Well, you, know, you hear it from both ends. There's definitely a divide in the Republican Party. 
you know, uh, and, but you've heard they were talking about a MAGA party that President Trump was said he wouldn't rule out, you know, starting a, right. a party of his own. Uh, you know, the, the more uh, traditional Republicans uh, are, are, I think, trying to get their own party back. <laughs> um, and so I think we're going to figure that out. It's very difficult to have a third party or to have any. I think there's a, a, an overwhelming majority of Americans. Now, the recent, one, one survey showed about 73% of the people in America are somewhere in the middle. They, they, they really aren't happy with the Democratic Party moving too far to the left. They're not really happy with where the Republican Party is. They're either moderate or right of center, left of center. They're not on the extremes of either party. And I think it is where most voters are, but it's very difficult uh, of a process to figure out how you uh, nominate people that can appeal to those people. <laughs> Lindsey Graham has said that he is quite worried about the midterm elections in 2022, given the rift that we've seen exposed between Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump. They're now at each other's throat. I'm more worried about 2022 than I've ever been. I don't want to eat our own. President Trump is the most consequential Republican in the party. We don't have a snowball's chance in hell of taking back the majority without Donald Trump. How concerned are you about that? Well, he ought to be concerned, and I'm sure uh, you know Leader McConnell is concerned as well. Look, if 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 they start primarying senators or congressmen who don't agree uh, with the president or don't support the president, and elect, you know, kind of uh, more you know QAnon supporters and really people that are out there on the fringe, they may be able to defeat them in a primary, but they're going to lose all those elections in November and. Uh, you know, I'm of the opinion we have to nominate candidates that can appeal to more people and win in November. It doesn't matter who you knock off in a primary. Apparently, the Trumpiest Republicans are at the state and local level, much more so than in the nation's capital. So how do you handle that trend and what can you do about that? Well, so, uh, you know, it's uh, the way these, it, it's the same thing in, the, in both parties, really. The most uh, activist folks are usually on the central committees at the, that run the local parties. They're not necessarily the actual leaders of the party in those states, and they're usually not elected officials. But, you know, they're, they're certainly the Trump uh, team took over most of the state party apparatus. Um, you're seeing some of those uh, party uh, uh, officials attacking, uh, you know, United States senators and congressmen who had the, the audacity to stand up and, and tell the truth. And, and, and or people and, like Cindy, people like Cindy McCain. Yeah, I'm going after Cindy McCain uh, and Governor Doug Ducey. And, uh, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's just crazy. So, you know, governors that were strong Trump supporters like Doug Ducey in Arizona or Governor Kemp in Georgia are being attacked by the Republicans. And, and you know, it, it just doesn't make any sense. But, you know, I, it's I wouldn't put a lot of stake in that. It doesn't really matter. You know, like, for example, in 2014, you know, I'm the second Republican in 50 years to get elected, only the second one in 243 years to get reelected. My state party um, you know, the apparatus did a state convention where I came in fourth place, but I'm, I'm the highest vote getter ever in the state. So I'm not sure they have as much influence as you think. And uh, they can criticize or censure all they want, but uh, leaders are going to step up and lead. It sounds as if you think that Republicans could potentially cannibalize themselves by putting forth candidates that are extreme right or very much, you know, Trump followers but cannot then have success on election day. I think that's the biggest, uh, the, big, the biggest concern because look, um, political parties exist because you wanna win elections so you get a chance to govern, so you can you know, get, push your ideas and your agenda. If we nominate people that are unelectable in November, we don't get to run anything. We don't get to, we don't, we're not going to have a Republican president. We're not going to have any Republicans controlling legislative bodies. We're going to lose our big majority among governors. We're going to lose legislative bodies. You know, we, we have to elect uh, in the primary, nominate the people that are most electable, or we're going to lose a whole lot more seats. The more pro Trump the GOP becomes, the more it could help the Democratic Party. Well, that's exactly my point. Katie, and that's the point I'm trying to make. I mean, I know, uh, you know, it's like, 
well, you're not a true believer, so we have to get rid of you. Well, yeah, I, I am. I do happen to be the most popular governor in America, <laughs> the only one to win in Maryland 243 years. So maybe you shouldn't get rid of me because you're not going to get, uh, you know, one of these guys. QAnon is not going to get elected governor in my state. There was some speculation that you might challenge Donald Trump in 2020. That didn't happen. But are you considering a possible run in 2024? I never really seriously considered it in 2020. There were a lot of people kind of encouraging that, but I never, you know, formed an exploratory or took it too seriously. I just didn't think it was possible. In 2024, I get that question a lot, and I'm not trying to duck your question, but I, we really are. I have a really important day job in the middle of a state of emergency, trying to save lives, trying to vaccinate millions of people, uh, working on our economic recovery, and I'm really going to try to stay focused on doing that important day job for at least the next two years of my term. And there's plenty of time between now and, you know, 2024 to worry about. But I am going to do what I can to, you know, save my party that I've been a part of my whole life. And I'm going to speak out and continue to try to be a voice. In the abstract, is it something that appeals to you, Governor? Well, it's certainly something, uh, not something I would rule out, especially if I felt the, the call to duty. If I, if I felt as if, I, you know, I, I, I was uh, somebody who could, uh, run a credible challenge and could potentially uh, get to take the party back on track. I mean, I'm more concerned about a future for the Republican Party than, than my future in the party. But, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, it's, it's something we're going to certainly take a look at. Governor Hogan, I, I know you were very concerned on January 6th. Tell me your reaction to the insurrection on Capitol Hill and the actions you took as a result. Well, I was shocked and outraged. Uh, I, I was in my office on a, on a uh, you know, video conference with uh, the ambassador from Japan to the United States. And my, uh, my chief of staff came in. It was much like George Bush when he was reading to the kids uh, in 9-11 when, when, when somebody whispered in his ear, my chief of staff says the Capitol is under attack. Uh, and uh, you know, I quickly excused myself from the, 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 call, the conference with the ambassador uh, I immediately called my security team in. My chief of staff have talked with the mayor of DC who was uh, desperately uh, asking for our assistance. I called my security team together in, within five minutes time, some in person, some uh, on a conference, uh, video conference. It was our, the, the, the uh, uh, adjutant general of our Maryland National Guard, the, the, the superintendent of the Maryland State Police, our Homeland Security, by all, all of our security team together, about 10 people and immediately said, what can we do? How fast can we move? Um, we called up our entire Maryland State Police um, uh, instant response team. They're all riot trained, immediately sent them heading towards Washington. Uh, and we, uh, the, we had this discussion about the National Guard. The mayor of DC was requesting help from our National Guard. It's a unique situation because- uh, You don't have a National Guard. But in DC, they don't have the authority. Uh, right. It, Every state governor, if Pennsylvania says, hey, we need help, we just send them over in Virginia. Uh, but in DC, we have to get the sign off from the Secretary of Defense. So we kept running it up the flagpole, you know, and we kept being denied by the Department of Defense. Meanwhile, while these meetings are going on, I get a call from Steny Hoyer, the majority leader, who says to me, you know, in a somewhat of panicked uh, voice, says he's in, he's been whisked away to a bunker or some undisclosed location with Speaker Pelosi and with Chuck Schumer. And he's saying, Governor, this, you know, the Capitol Police have been overwhelmed and they've taken over the Capitol. Can you send us help? You know, just, you know, begging for help. And I said, you know, Steny, uh, we have several hundred members of the uh, you know, Maryland State Police on the way. They, they, they should be there shortly. Um, and he said, we need the, can you send the National Guard? And I said, I've called up my National Guard. We called up a thousand members of the National Guard, but we don't have authorization. And Steny was yelling across the room to, he's saying, hey, Chuck, you know, Hogan says they don't have authorization. And he says, you know, Hoyer says, no, the, Chuck says you do. And I'm saying, Steny, I'm telling you, I don't. We've been told three times by the Department of Defense, we don't have authorization. So it's back and forth, back and forth. About two hours later, I'm still in a meeting with my team talking about where are the guards stationed outside of DC, how many police are in there. I get a call on my cell phone from Ryan McCarthy, the acting secretary of the army. He is on a number on my personal phone I don't even recognize, and I, but I answered anyway, you know, a Virginia number. And he says, uh, can you send the National Guard into DC? And I was like, 
uh, yeah, we've been waiting <laughs> for two hours. So uh, we, we, Maryland National Guard were the first, first ones from outside of DC to, to arrive. The Maryland State Police were next to arrive after the Metropolitan Police. Uh, and we, we did everything we could to support them. We sent a thousand members of the National Guard. We sent, I think, 280 members of the Maryland State Police and some of our allied county police forces, uh, Prince George's and Montgomery County. But the hoops you had to go through, the hoops you had to jump through, Governor, I mean, it's just unbelievable. Do you believe that a 9-11 style commission will be able to get to the bottom of it and this is the right thing to do to investigate what happened and why? You know, I do think we need full transparency and I think we need to get to the bottom of exactly what happened and why. You know, frankly, I've been so busy focused on the COVID crisis. I don't know, I don't know all the details of what the proposal has been on the, on the establishment of the commission that I heard the speaker talk about. My concern is that, um, you know, we really need a fair and objective process. Um, and if it's just another, if it's a partisan process just run by the House Democrats, um, it, it's not likely to have, uh, you know, it, it's, we're going to be mired in the same divisiveness and dysfunction with Republicans and Democrats retreating to their corners. I, I think time is going to tell exactly how Donald Trump and his administration comes out of this. I think he's still got things to address and potentially in court cases and certainly the court of public opinion. But I, I'm not sure uh, that another congressional effort is, is really what we need right now, as we have to really focus on this COVID crisis that is killing people across the country. We're fighting variants. We need vaccines and we need the economic recovery package. We need a compromise bill. Get, that, that's really, I'm more concerned about that right now than arguing more about what happened last month. You, in fact, this week signed Maryland's $1 billion bipartisan relief bill, which you said will help Marylanders barely hanging on right now. Um, can you just give us an update on what the situation is like in your state and the continued frustration that you're feeling about vaccine distribution? And if you're feeling more hopeful with President Biden's plan to get people vaccinated? Well, yeah, sure. Well, I'm very proud of the fact that just on Monday, I, I signed into law this Relief Act of 2021, which was our signature piece of legislation. I said it was the most important thing for our legislative session uh, to focus on. My legislature, 70 percent uh, Democratic in both the House and the Senate. Um, and uh, I, I called on them to work with us in a bipartisan way. It's more than a billion dollars in, in tax relief and economic stimulus for struggling Maryland families and small businesses and people who've lost their jobs. And it passed nearly unanimously. One Republican in the House voted against it. Every Democrat and every Republican in the Senate voted for it. So it's what I've been saying. I had a meeting in the Oval Office with Joe Biden for an hour and a half on Friday. And I said to him, I really think it would be better if you could find a compromise that the Republicans could get on board with. And th this was, you know, it, it, earlier in the day, I went back to Annapolis and passed the bill <laughs> nearly unanimously with my Democratic legislators. I was trying to put my money where my mouth is. Um, but on the vaccines, it's very hopeful that we now have vaccines. The fact that they're actually out a year or 18 months before anyone imagined they could be, Operation Warp Speed was a success. Uh, but we just don't have enough vaccines and all the governors, we have calls every week with the coronavirus uh, team from, from the Biden administration. Uh, Jeff Science is heading that up. We have on there all of the cabinet officials and uh, you know, the head of the CDC and everybody. And we have the, the lines of communication are good. We have set up huge infrastructures. We're now doing about uh, sticking the 30,000 needles a day in people's arms, vaccinating them. But we only receive 12,000 a day from the federal government. We could do 100,000 a day if we had the vaccine supply. And it, it really, it's a, it's a race between, from, between vaccines and variants. It's very scary stuff out there and we just have to have more. So we had calls today with some of the manufacturers. Um, we, we, we've been talking everywhere about how do we increase this capacity? It's nobody's fault. It's not uh, to criticize anyone. Everybody's trying their best. It's all hands on deck. We, it's the federal, state and local governments and the private sector working together but it's way too slow. We, we just need more vaccines. Every state does. When you expressed your frustrations to President Biden, did you get anything that encouraged you or made you more optimistic about this? 
Well, I, first of all, I was I was optimistic in that he reached out, you know, uh, that the president and vice president spent an hour and a half with four governors in the Oval Office, two Republicans and two Democrats, and actually listened and said, you know, very sincerely that they do want to work in a bipartisan way and that we, we are all in this together. And, um, and and he did listen to some of our concerns about the vaccine rollout. Uh, it wasn't criticism on our part, but we were basically saying, look, we need more uh, understanding of when and how many and where, because we're making the decisions about, we have 20, 2,300 distrib distribution points in Maryland, and yet we don't know kind of when we're getting a supply or how many or where they're sending them to pharmacy. So a little more coordination and, and they've promised to try to improve some of those things with us. Governor Hogan, thank you so much. You're always so fun to talk to and, and mm -hmm. so like direct and you actually <laughs> answer the questions. It's a real pleasure. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Katie. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity.